legislation that they were introducing, written by someone or something else, you would think there would be some of that, but you would think there would be a lot of legislation that's written by council members that well, are trying to fill a need. I think that's what we're trying to do with the policy committee on the Charter Change Committee. We found out during the orientation that of the thousand bills that came through city council last year, city council initiated less than 10. And so that's what we're trying to expect. Right, right. But on city council, you know, you to get seven votes or nine if you don't want to veto. And so I think there's been a culture of complacency, but I also think that even now, with different diverging voices, we still have to get to a space where seven people will support something. And it, it's lazy to not do it, and I completely think that it's, you know, a lack of motivation in the past that... I, I, would, that I would even think that newly elected council members, even, you know, during their first term, they would say, like, I got this one, I got this one, I got this one, and I'm excited about it. And it's also not fair to expect that. So as a, as someone who's been in there two months, you know, we're there's no there's no handbook telling us how to do this job. And so as we're being bombarded with you know the, the meetings Monday through Wednesday for committee and then all the contracts that we get on Monday nights to vote on, there's a learning curve. And for us to be able to end up um, garnering the respect and being able to pull together the stakeholder groups to pass something that we've initiated, we need to also be able to do the other part of the job well. And if we're thoughtful, you know, passing those contracts, that's the first strings. That's where we have the most power as a, as a body, a legislative body. And so you want us to also focus on pass on approving and denying the right contracts with the private prison contract that we denied. When was the last time you ever recall city council denying a contract? No, it's the same as with the Colorado Oil and Gas uh, uh, Board, right? Their job has supposed to be like to regulate for the safety of the communities, but like basically all they did was pass oil uh, well after oil well. They never denied one. And so that's been the kind of the same rule is just kind of rubber stamping things and not really understanding the impacts or the influence that each of these has a responsibility. Uh, what's their what's their buy in? to the community and what are they doing right. to deserve and earn those contracts. And so if I were, you know, if I, if I were on the community side of things, um, as I was two months ago, what I would be paying attention to is not only what is council coming forward with that they've initiated, but how is the new council scrutinizing uh, the contracts before us? <coughs> on Thursdays, every Thursday when we get the agenda for what we're going to vote on the following Monday, Everything is in what they call a consent agenda, which is a block vote. Meaning, if you don't comb through that as a city council member and pull things out to vote on separately, you're automatically saying yes to every single thing on that list. Right. And so if your council members are not combing through that, if you don't see them calling things out, if you don't see them asking questions, then you have someone who is probably not paying attention to the power we have with the first strings. Um, and maybe they're working on something on the side to initiate ordinances, but if you know for a fact they're not, then I think we have a responsibility as the public to ask what they're doing. So back to that legislation mm -hmm. question that he asked a minute ago. Uh, so respect that learning curve and that time that it takes. But how do we get legislation that the community knows that's needed and to work with you quickly so that that can be realized? Well, so for example, the first thing that has come up since I've been here was the climate change tax. Um, we have to recognize how the opposition, uh, how powerful the opposition can be depending on who the opposition is. So with the climate bill tax, um, what we were trying to do was refer something to the ballot um, to tax corporations, uh, industrial users, and commercial users of energy so that we could 
pay for an office and pay for the ability to help low-income residences get up to speed <coughs> on their um, climate action. Um, that immediately died because of how powerful the opposition was. The opposition is uh, industrial and commercial users of energy. Think about who that is throughout the city. That, that resistance mounted very quickly and very powerfully to get everybody to back down, to stand down. Um, and you saw on the second vote, you saw who was still adamant about us needing to do something, and you saw who had backed down. Um, we need to be, when we're planning on how to advance something together, it's not enough to just have a bunch of people who support it. We have to understand who doesn't support it. And we have to understand what kind of war they can wage against our effort and be ready to like withstand that. I mean, we, we just went through this with the right with to with 300. You know, we had an incredible amount of support for that. We had polling that said that it, it should have done better than it did, but the opposition had enough money to wage a different kind of war against that. Well, I'd say better right. Well, and so I just recently learned that the oil and gas companies in another state are hiring former military psych ops, the people who would like do the psychological warfare in foreign countries as their uh, duty of service record. Right? That's what they were. That's what they did overseas to convince like the people over there to like love America and not you know their local home group organizations. And so it's the same kind of thing going on in in our communities, is what you're saying. Yeah, and it's not it's disturbing, but not surprising. It's, pl it's the um, way it's planned. This is, you know, when you can afford to hire that kind of person on your team to mess with someone psychologically and influence the way they think, you're going to do it. That's exactly what mass media, mass marketing is and does. And there's a lot of um, there's. They're all of our opposition, if they can afford that, that's still due to us. So part of what our job is, while we're working on these pieces of legislation, is to educate our community about the impact of mass marketing on them. You know, sit down and talk to your neighbors about how they understand, you know, mass media, mass marketing to be affecting them. Most people don't realize that they're giving them all of the information that they want about us to influence our decisions with everything. With the sites we shop on, with um, our Facebook, with everything, with the things we click on that we like when we're on our on our social media, all of that information gets purchased by these companies who want to change the way we think about the issue. And all they have to do is like to know that information to to know what angle to use on this. And they can individualize it too. In many yeah. cases, yeah. There's a Netflix um, documentary. The greatest app. Mm -hmm. It talks about how these companies, you know, especially in electoral politics, they'll buy information from these other companies that have basically collected all of your data about the things you like and care about, and then they use it against you in the electoral space, in the political space, even when it's completely separate. Any more questions? You can't see the Yes, and thanks to Kenny Bacchus for, for some of the stuff up on the street. So, um, so Lisa Calderon, Mr. Uh, Kizak, and Kim, uh, Corey uh, came out to, to help support and, um, and basically ask questions and be a presence to hold the city officials accountable uh, here this week on Wednesday. Yeah. Um, At minimum, it would be helpful, you know, until we get a piece of legislation to decriminalize homelessness. It would be helpful for you guys to put pressure on the other city council members where there might be sweeps. Yeah, where there might be sweeps so that they can show up the way that we did. You know, I think that us showing up with media really deterred them from being more violent, more aggressive. Um, we need to change the fact that public works can, or Parks and Rec can give out citations that turn into criminal cases. Our sheriffs can't even. Like, Parks and Rec can do that? Yeah, that's part of 
Parks and Rec was cleaning up. It wasn't even, it was a Parks and Rec cleanup. I would like to see some in and around this as possible to where, from positions such as yours, where you guys talk about how their constituents have been manipulated by the mass media. Talk about a good reference to that is what happened with the election and how you just see the because people's general disposition is one way. They got moved to the big And somehow, as representatives of our communities, maybe we need to stand in front of that and reconsider um, what happened in cases like that and how often it's happening in other stuff. Um, and re bring it up because if it's ignored, because right now I would hear the council members saying, well, my constituents say this, but they were ignored them. They weren't there initially. It's a harp. Somehow that? to continually, harp. I mean, I also know that it's harp. I mean, it's hard. It's hard as equals to educate our peers when there are blind spots mm -hmm. um, because we're all here on the same podium, elected theoretically by the people, um, and so everybody has that crutch. Everybody who sits up there has that crutch to say that my constituents put me here. Um, the way that we understand mass marketing, uh, I think, can be reflected in how we use it. So, you know, we're constant. We understand mass marketing deeply. We use our social media. We understand um, the power of social media. We understand uh, the power of marketing. You've been in the news like three or four times in the last week or two. Right. And we use it in a way to counter what the opposition does. Um, Very good. If you look at how other people might be using it, maybe their lack of using it shows a lack of understanding about it. Maybe the way that they use it shows a lack of understanding of the way it can be used or is being used against them. And so, or against their constituents. Or against their constituents. And the people who do these things are not quiet about how they manipulate us. They, I mean, they're very clear about how they manipulate us through these systems, these tools. Um, and so I think it's about just constantly educating people. You might not be able to get all of them there where you need them to be, but we do have the power to talk to every single person we know about how they're being influenced. Um, Unfortunately. A lot of it's miseducation, and all it takes is correcting the information that they were force fed. A lot mm -hmm. of people feel they can't be manipulated. They're immune to this. I've, I run into that, and I, those are probably the ones that are most easily. Yeah, it's hard, it's hard to tell them, but that's what's happening. Right, right, right. The city council has an example of where they felt that they couldn't be manipulated uh, for an appointment they made for someone who joined oh, yeah. most people's campaigns, and nobody was willing to say, like, gee, I have a conflict of interest. I'm going to recuse myself um, or find some other accountability. And it's been proven right that maybe some extra steps or some extra self accountability and acknowledgement that I can be manipulated um, can be appropriate. So, what Ben's referring to there is Roger Sherman. Yeah. Was, so, uh, uh, called out by Kevin Rucka to not be uh, considered. And no public discussion. And then he comes out as a fucking racist. I mean, yep. as if we didn't know that to begin with. You know, we had to, we, same thing with the whole great call situation. Same, we had these opportunities for people to have voted a certain way, and now there's proof that against, against their better judgment, this was not a good idea, right? And so to just keep drawing the messages, making those, Connections clear, um, especially when you testify. You know, Jesse testifies every single time. You're here with some of the greatest like institutional knowledge, and to be able to connect the dots every time you get up there is important yes. because we're we're not voting on new things. We're voting on the same thing over and over and over and over. And testimony needs to connect the dots for them and say, hey, you did this over here. You're about to do the same exact thing. Like, do we want the same outcome? 
Yeah. Because we'll get really like two minutes or three minutes there with and then get really focused on reading off our laundry list of all our concerns about that one particular thing without connecting it to the larger context and to what happened before. Well, I want to yeah. say thank you for leading by example with that sustainable water bottle. Yeah. It's a big deal. And it's Project Voice, yeah. my baby. Fantastic. All right, folks, thanks for watching.